All right, apparently Ben wasn't kidding when he warned me a couple minutes ago. So I'll take that as my cue. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Peter Lutheran Church. We're glad you could be with us today. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started here. Uh, the men's breakfast is coming up, guys, uh, January 4th, and uh, we forgot to ask somebody to cook for it. So we'll start thinking about that, and uh, next week will be your final warning to volunteer for that and uh, to be able to serve uh, breakfast up for us. I uh, just want you to note in the bulletin uh, the different service times. It's that time of year when there's uh, several different services, and so we have uh, today, and then we have uh, Christmas Eve is uh, the Christmas program, and then Christmas morning at 9 a.m. will be a service on Wednesday morning, and then next Sunday we'll have service as usual, and then New Year's morning will be a 9 a.m. service also. For those that don't, or you, well, you just stay up all night and then come to church and then go home and go to sleep. Um, don't fall asleep during church. I will try not to. Uh, the youth have a gathering that night. Um, I'm not sure all the details, but you're, if you're allowed to be invited, I guess you're invited. So I, I forgot to clarify or get asked, uh, ask whether that's open to everybody or just the kids. So <laughs> you probably know better than I do at this point, but I assume I can crash it. So uh, I'll be there. So hopefully I'll be awake the next morning. We'll see how that goes. I'm looking forward to it, though. Feel young for a little while, at least. Um, and then this week in my email, for those of you who get the email from me this week, uh, I, I kind of made a point that it would be really good for, uh, it, well, it's good for our relationship with God, period. But I thought it would be good as a church for us to read through the Bible this coming year and to, to kind of do that as a church. And, you know, normally it's easy to say, okay, read through the Bible, start in the beginning and go front to back, and it, it's a lot harder to, to keep with that when you get to certain points. It gets hard to read the same thing day after day. And so uh, what I did is I included in the email uh, a, what's called a chronological Bible reading plan. And so what that does is it reads through the Bible more in a historical manner. And so there's a lot of parts of the Bible that are the same part of history but told through a different perspective, um, especially Chronicles and Kings but also the Gospels, the four Gospels, as they go through, a lot of times they're writing on the same thing that happened at the same time. And so as we read through the Bible together next year, um, it'll be in chronological order. So you'll be reading the same things through uh, different writers sometimes, and you kind of get a different and a deeper view of what that event was and what the significance of those events were. And so what I'm hoping is if, you know, I'm not asking you to make a formal commitment uh, I'm asking you to consider it, pray on it, and we wouldn't start till the, the beginning of the year. But um, to, to think about doing that, because I'll reference where we are throughout the year, um, possibly in sermons if it matches up with what we're covering there, but it might, might not match our year. Um, but, you know, we can, you can ask one another, like, you know, hey, did you read this part this week? Uh, I didn't understand that, or I thought this was really neat and cool, or whatever the current popular vernacular is for it was awesome. Um, you know, so you can share those things because most of the people around you will be doing the same thing. And it, and I, I, there, I how do I want to word this? Because you got to kind of be careful this way, right? We don't do things to get things from God, but I can tell you that God's word is living and active. And if you are in a daily relationship with him, you're reading his word and you're praying with him and, and you're, you're having that back and forth with God daily, I can promise you your life will change. Now, if you're actively living in sin, it's probably going to make it harder on you because it's going to convict you and it's going to make you want to change bad behaviors. Um, but the reality is, in the long term, it's all about God desiring relationship with you and wanting to bless you. And so if we can do that together, I think that'll really benefit us. And so uh, uh, in the email, I had a link to the reading plan uh, if you want to read it uh, on a document on a computer or phone. But I also printed some off this morning. I'll have some back there with me. Uh, as you're walking out, and we'll have, I'll have more each week. So if you need a copy of that or you want a copy this morning, just let me know, and I'll make sure to, uh, to get that into your hands. And if you know anybody else you want to, to share that with, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that says you can't. So if you have a neighbor or a coworker and you want to include them in this, uh, I encourage you to do that. And uh, if you can include your kids and family that way too, that'd be great as well. But um, either way, I think it's great for us to get into the Word. Um, before I make a couple of health-related announcements, are there any other announcements or things that we need to know from the congregation? 
All right, sometimes I feel good that there aren't any because it means I, I hit things that are important probably, um, but other times I always feel like I forgot something. Um, Todd reports his mom is doing okay now. She has been on a heart monitor, but she's, as I thought feisty is probably an appropriate word sometimes, she's as, <laughs> she isn't afraid to speak her mind like usual, and she's, you know, just, um, there's something going on with her heart they're not sure about, but she's still in good shape, so we'll keep her in prayers. And then uh, Steve Lau is going in for a procedure tomorrow to remove some spots from his liver, and so we want to keep him in prayer. Uh, it's, you know, the big C word that affects many of our lives and probably several of us that have people actively in our lives right now that we know about, so we want to keep that in prayer and pray that that procedure goes well tomorrow and, and removes whatever's there. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Shayton. There you go. Okay, you guys are right there. All right. We light the fourth candle on the Advent wreath in praise of Jesus, who came to the earth to save us from sin, death, and the devil. day in the city of David. A Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. The angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law. Our salvation has arrived in the birth of the Christ child. Through his sinless life, death, and resurrection, we shall have life forevermore. So with the hosts of heaven, we are glad, and with all the earth, we rejoice. What the Father's most desire, what the prophet's heart inspired, what the We continue with our opening prayer. Please rise as you are able. <laughs> Father, we thank you for bringing and gathering us here this morning. We thank you for a beautiful sunrise and gorgeous weather this weekend. We ask that you continue to bless us as we partake in the service that you have for us this morning, Lord. Bless us through the music, through the prayers, through your word, and through the presence of one another, the body of Christ. Lord, I ask that you uh, be with those who haven't been able to make it with us. I ask that you be with those who this morning haven't made it. And draw them to yourself, Lord, as you have drawn us. 
I ask that this morning be memorable and remarkable in our lives our, because of our relationship with you, that in some way you'll touch each and every one of our hearts and our minds here, that we might go forth singing your praises and being thankful for the ways that you have blessed and redeemed our lives. All these things we lift up in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn. You may be seated. What child is this? Please rise as you are able as we go before the Lord with our confession, found on page 49, number 12. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you to seek your forgiveness for our sins. We have sinned by disobedience and omission, with pride and selfishness, and with disrespect and unrighteous living. For these we are truly sorry and seek your mercy and grace. Cleanse us according to your word. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
receive now this prayer for all of us from the, and to our Lord. It says, O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, you who have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they turn from their way and live, we pray to you that you would be merciful and mercifully avert the punishment that our sins deserve. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And with that declaration, we are given his grace and declared sin sinless. We continue with our hymn, Son of God, Eternal Savior. You may be seated. upon your people and upon your father's house 
such as the days that have not come since the day that Ephron departed from Judah, the king of Israel. The second reading is from Romans 1, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to be lost, belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to please rise as you are able for the gospel reading this morning. <clears throat> the holy gospel this morning comes from St. Matthew, or the Apostle Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Here ends our gospel lesson. We continue with the confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. may be seated at this time invite the ushers to come forward to help with our offering
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and to give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with. We pray and ask that you use these gifts in ways that will be so bountiful that we can't even imagine. We ask for you to bless the sacrifices that are made, that we might know you better through seeing you work through these gifts. And this includes our time and our talents as well, Lord, as we in this season are working on different things in the church and programs and and different things in our communities. May there always be a bounty of blessing for those who are in your will and doing your work. Lord, we come together to ask for you to take care of our people who are hurting, those who are physically dealing with things and and struggling with uh, ill health or bodies that are slowly winding down. Lord, we ask that you give comfort and reassurance, that you give ways to compensate and and make each day uh, enjoyable and able to be endured in our pain and suffering. We ask that you give uh, guidance to doctors and surgeons where necessary, where people are being uh, worked on and, and intervened in to try to improve their health or prevent further decline in health, Lord. We think especially of, of Steve tomorrow. We ask that you be with the doctors to find all that they need to remove and for him to go through that procedure without any complications and to come back home to us in better shape than he is now. Lord, we ask that you be with Verna continually as they try to figure out what's going on with her heart and, and uh, that you continue to give her a lively spirit regardless of how her health is going. She always seems to be in a pretty positive mood, and so we thank you for that attitude, Lord, and, and continue to be with those this Christmas season and this holiday season, especially, Lord, with absences at the table, and we think of lost husbands and children and, and just uh, and lost parents as well this past year, and, and this can be a rough time of year, Lord, and, and many of us can think of others that we've lost in, in absences, and maybe it's clouded because we are surrounded by many friends and family that, that and, and time has gone on that maybe heals the wounds a little bit, but any people that we've had in our lives that we've lost are are a part of who we are, and we recognize that, Lord. Help us to use this holiday time to remember and and recall memories and not be afraid to remember, not be afraid to shed tears over loss and emptiness, but to remember what we had, the blessing that we had, that time was a gift, and no matter how short or long that time was, it, it impacted our lives, and they those people were a part of our story, and that can never be taken away, and it can no longer be added to, but it can impact how we act each day and, and how we think and how we relate to others, and, and it changes and, and makes us into the people you want us to be, Lord. You bring different people in and out of our lives for different reasons, Lord. Sometimes it's because we need help and strength, and sometimes it's because we need to be the help and strength for those other people. And so in our circumstances, whatever they may be, show us what we need to learn from them. Give us wisdom to know how that will change our lives. Give us wisdom to know how we can bless others with the knowledge that we have through the pain that we have endured, regardless of what that pain is, emotional, financial, physical, Whatever it happens to be, Lord, be with us and guide us in that. Give us wisdom and guidance on on how you want to prepare us for the next day and the day after that and then eventually for our eternity, Lord. As we dive into your word this morning, we we ask that you, you bless us through it, that it prepares our heart, mind, and body for eternity. It prepares us now, though, for the mission that we have on this planet, to be healed by you, and restored by you so that we might proclaim your glory and proclaim the good works of you who created us and redeemed us and promises to bless us. And Lord, we thank you and ask for guidance and continued blessing upon those who have traveled and and will be traveling through this holiday season. Keep them safe and help them to enjoy the time that they have with family and friends Help them to appreciate every moment that they have, for each moment is a gift, and we don't know how many we have, and let us not take them for granted. And Lord, we pray for those who aren't here who should be. We pray for those who aren't here that could be, and we pray for those who aren't here that maybe never would come into our church, but maybe we know them and they're connected with them, that they might 
know you better, all these different people, Lord, that they might find a way or somebody who comes into their lives that you've sent to them that might open the Word of God to them and pray with them and turn their brokenheartedness into a healed heart through your Word and through your promises. So as we take this moment of silence to reflect and share with you the things that are on our hearts and minds, let us also share with you those whom we are concerned about, whom we desire for them to know you better, to make better choices with their lives as we lift them up to you now in this silence. Lord, thank you for little children. We thank you for the Christmas program and all the work that's being done to put that on. We ask that you bless their, their program practice this morning and that you bless them this coming Tuesday evening that they might get to know you better through this program, Lord, the kids as well as those who receive it in the pews. Bless the work that's been done, the sacrifices that have been made of time and, and other resources that it may glorify you, and that we also may joy, take joy and delight in seeing the children working in the church and serving us through their service to you. All these things we lift up in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with Away in a Manger. Join me in prayer. Father, I ask that you work through your word, that the ideas are not my ideas, but the the intent and the ideas that are from you to us. Help us to take away from this the things that you desire to work on our hearts and prepare them and mold them into the hearts that reflect you more than the world, that reflect you more than us that reflect you more than whatever else is influencing in this world. Lord, use your word in a mighty way this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here ends the three-part Be Prepared series, if you will, although those are just, in reality, it's just three different titles that kind of work together. God put together this order of selections before I ever came around here, <clears throat> and the church here was planned out and, and that, so nothing really of my devising other than the clever titles, I suppose, so if you've enjoyed them, that's great, if not, it's no big deal, because it's not God's titles. 
But we did be prepared in our mind when we saw John the Baptist calling people to repentance, calling them to change their minds to what the reality of God was to be and to reflect on the fact that God was coming and he was ushering them in and to be prepared mentally and not check out at the door. When we come into the doors of church, we don't take our brains out and, and follow a blind faith that we were raised in. We follow a faith that has a, a logical, reasoning God behind it, one with the ultimate mind that gave us a little bit and put a little bit of himself in us when he gave us, his, gave us our minds and gave us the ability to think and reason and to make decisions and to, to do things and not just be programmed robots. And so our minds are significant, and they're really a key beginning to our faith. We have a faith that is worth reasoning through, that is worth investigating. And when it is investigated and when it is challenged, it stands up to that challenge. And we shouldn't always just assume, even if we've been raised in the church, grown up in it all our lives, and believe it wholeheartedly, we shouldn't just let that end there. We should always be diving into it, wanting to learn more, wanting to test it and, and to... to to, uh, to use, uh, plumb the depths, if you will, to, to dig into it that we might know it further. And the more we know, and this is true after seminary even, the more we realize we don't know. <laughs> and so, you know, you may look at the pastor up here and me or whoever else comes up here and you'd be like, oh, they know so much more than me. It's like the reality is, you know what, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. You know a heck of a lot more about farming and many other things than I do. Um, but the reality is there's still more that there's others that know more about it than you do, whatever you know well. And it's the same thing with me. You know, I may be up here because in the eyes of the world, I'm more qualified in some sense. But we're all on equal footing in that. We all are ignorant of a lot more that God desires to reveal to us. And he reveals to each of us in different ways and in different amounts and at different times because he, the reality is he's using us and he uses us for his purposes. And sometimes that's in knowledge, maybe it's in ignorance, and maybe it's just in being humble and having a humble heart. But when you prepare your mind, you, you can receive that and interact with him on a conversational level, regardless of your ability. And know that you are worthy because he, he gave you that mind you have, no matter what its, its caliber. And then being prepared in body was last week. And the significant thing there was being prepared not just for this reality, but the reality of eternity. That there's something bigger than this and that, that we need to be prepared for what that means and not take for granted this life and this reality. And today, it's appropriate as we look at the, the coming of the baby Jesus to be prepared in our hearts. And we talked about mind and body, but there's also a feeling component there's a, there's a reality that it, it's something, is a spark in us, like your battery in your car, that, that if that's charged up, we can get up in the morning and the day is probably going to be a good day. But when that charge isn't there, the battery, you know, you can't get the starter to turn over very well some mornings. There's a lot of people in the world around us that it's hard. It's hard to get out of bed in the morning. So they don't have that heart. They don't have... That, that certain something that we call heart, that inner spirit, that inner strength to get out of bed, to want to get out of bed, to want to go to work, to want to interact with family or friends. They're lacking that, that spark of life in us. And that's what we're looking at today. We want to see a situation where it reminds us and it, it equips us to be prepared in our hearts, with our hearts, that we might have the hope and the strength <laughs> To, to stand up and to be strong and to boldly proclaim that we are saved and redeemed and that we have a God who created us and who saved us and loves us and that it's worth sharing that because he has all the details in his hands. That's a song I should have did this morning. I will do it one of these days. We'll all participate. But he's got the whole world in his hands. It's always a great reminder. So this is what's happening. This is what's taking place. And Matthew is kind of looking back and, and recounting what's, what was going on. And he says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now this is a little different than, than our situation in America today. 
Um, this isn't the engagement as per se. It's kind of like the betrothal, you were married. You were legally married, but you weren't physically married yet. But you were belonged, you belonged to one another. Mary would say that, that Joseph was her man, and Joseph would say that Mary was her woman. In the Greek, it doesn't actually say husband or wife. It's, it's just the word for woman or man, and the context dictates what, when we call it husband or wife. But the reality is, is in, in the, this, this sentence here, whenever it uses the word husband or it uses the word wife, it's referring to the fact that the one who belonged to that other person. Not in like a slave type belonging, but it's the deepness of that relationship that, that I am Jacqueline's and Jacqueline is mine. And we call that husband and wife in our culture here and in the context of marriage. But it's, it's a deeper belonging. And I'll, I'll say that Noah and Ezra are my sons, but eventually I'm going to kick them out of the house. They're not, you know, they'll always be my sons, but you know, I don't, it's not the same type of relationship. It's one that's meant to never be broken regardless of the things in the world around us. And so they were that tightly together, Mary and Joseph. And so for them to, to go apart, it wasn't, it wasn't like today where people just kind of, oh yeah, we're engaged and we're not engaged, or you know, we're a couple or we're not a couple, and, and people kind of do that willy-nilly in our, in our culture without, without thinking about it. They, they don't see the significance of the, that relationship and what it's meant to be. But back then... The, the, for the Jews especially, this was a significant relationship. This was a, 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 a specific process, and, and they were betrothed. And now all of a sudden, it wasn't, they didn't just hook up, and, 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 and they, they, that relationship was very um, special and not meant to be shared with everybody. And so it's significant then that she was, when she was found with child that they were husband and wife legally and binding and and now she was pregnant without there having been a consummation of that relationship. And that was a significant deal. And it tells us here as it continues, her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now by all rights in the biblical laws, Joseph being, when it says he was a just man, it's a way of referring to the fact that he was a faithful follower of God. Both him and Mary were faithful followers of God. And I'm, and I'm sure at that point, when he found that situation out, he was probably beginning to doubt like how serious her relationship with God was. But the reality was, in, in the Jewish scriptures, you could very publicly disgrace the woman. You could, you could possibly have her stoned or, or take her to a very open and public court and have a divorce situation where she would be marked for life not just because of the child, but just because of her reputation, would have been soiled forever. This was all very serious in their culture. But he decided to resolve it quietly. So there's something going on there where, you know, he had respect for her. They must, the relationship must have been more than just an arranged marriage situation. There must have been some relationship that was there. They were looking forward to being married, I would assume. And so he decided to try to like, you know, okay, well, this is really weird and you, you, you know, you've said something and I don't know if I, you know, because she, she, I'm sure she related how she got pregnant. And now guys, be honest, if your wife came to you or a girlfriend came to you and said, you know, hey, God got me pregnant, uh, I don't know if we would really, be, would you take that seriously? Could you really believe that? I mean, it had to be pretty, a pretty weird situation. But at the same time, he must have had some semblance of knowing, like, okay, something, something's going on here. I don't know. But he decided to, to do it a little more privately, and he was going to try to, he was trying to get out of the situation because he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable in that situation, like many of us probably wouldn't necessarily, unless we knew more details and had some, something outside of us saying, no, no, it's okay. There's a plan here. And that's exactly what happens, because as he was considering these things, and the likely time period is, this is probably after Mary had gone and been with her cousin Elizabeth for a while. Elizabeth had John the Baptist. John the Baptist was her son. And he was, uh, she was about six months pregnant, I believe, when, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth. And, and Mary was pregnant at that time. But she, after a few months there, she, 
came back, and so she was well along in her pregnancy. And Joseph has been considering these things, and it's at that time in his anguish and his, you know, he, many of us, men and women alike, we sit in bed or we, on a daily basis, there's always something we're like, oh, Lord, what, do I, what am I going to do with this situation? You know, especially this past year, right? Most of the situations have been around the weather and the circumstances of, of just the, the reality of things not being normal this year. And we've taken that to the Lord, I'm sure most of us, in every situation, some relational situations, some financial situations, some just weather and, and water situations. But we've been constantly going back and forth with the Lord, like, Lord, why is this happening now? Lord, should I plant? Should I not plant? Lord, what, what should I do? How can we support this relationship or whatever else this struggle is going on? And that's where he was at. He was in that anguish moment. He's whether it's through prayer or just in, in thinking and, and trying to figure it out as a guy. And so he was considering those things. It just says as he considered these things, but there's so much more behind that. And God comes to us in those times because he knows we need his wisdom. And it says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And this is what God said to Joseph. And he says it a specific way for a reason. He says, Joseph, son of David... Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph, son of David. The Jews were very meticulously following their lineage because every generation was looking for that king that would be born. They were looking to be that family that would bring forth the Messiah, bring forth the promised king. And so when it says Joseph, son of David, it's, it's the angel, God, is, is deliberately pointing him to that fact. Like, hey, wake up. This is something special that I promised. And the reality is we know more from the greater biblical story. The reality is that the son could not directly be physically Joseph's son because the fathers from Adam down the line have been passing on sinfulness. None of our fathers, no matter how much we love them or respect them, are without sin. And no matter how much we think we're great, we inherited that from them, and we pass that on to our sons and kids and to their kids, and, and it's just the reality that our sinful nature is passed down through the Father. But through that connection, God is still making that connection that, you know what, this descendant is your son and that I've given him to you. And he is the promised one to come. And so don't fear to take Mary as your wife because this is from me. And it's speaking to that fact that the Holy Spirit, God himself, has brought forth Jesus, not separately from the human race, bound with Mary and to the human race through the conception, so that he is just as much the Son of God, having come from God, but he's also just as much one of us, having come from a woman. And in the original, into Genesis, God clearly states that Eve would be the mother of all living. And that includes Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need that connection because that's what allows him to experience and take that burden of sin away from us because he is one of us. And at the same time, he is God, perfect and able to overcome our weaknesses and our inabilities. And it also says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. It doesn't say that it, would Joseph, that it was Joseph's son in that sense, it, that she would bear a son. There's an, a distinction there that you can read in, when it talks about John the Baptist, when Zechariah is promised that he would have a son. And, his, and it talks about him being his son. But here it just says, she will bear a son. And it's not just a son with a little s, it's the son, the one we've all been waiting for, the babe in the manger that we just sang about. You have to wonder sometimes, why does he use that? You know, the, the, the humble little baby in a cradle or in a manger and the one that, like little Kirby back there, has to be held and protected and can't do anything for himself. Maybe it's for us to remember the significance of that. 
God allows us to be his strength. God brings himself below us so that we might be able to take care of him. He's giving us an opportunity in another way to, to bear his image, the image of protector and caregiver. And you got to be honest, right? Sometimes, you know, when we're weak, when we need help, like when we're in our sinfulness, we don't feel all that great. When we have to ask others for help, we don't feel very strong in our hearts. We often are, are hesitant to submit to ask somebody else for help. And so maybe that's why God did this. Maybe that's why God gave us baby Jesus. Because that allowed us then to have to be the nurturing parents to protect him and raise him. Because, you know, the other reality is that when we are strong, when we are the ones that others are asking for help, doesn't that give you a strong heart? Doesn't that make you feel good to know that you are helping someone else out? That you are able, God has equipped you with a blessing or financial or physical or otherwise, that you're able to help others? And I don't know of any situation for me personally, at least, when I was helping somebody else that it didn't, even if it was a situation where I didn't really want to help, it still built something into me. It built something into my heart and prepared it and, and it worked it and it made me feel stronger because of my strength being able to help somebody else. And I think that that's part of what God is doing here. Why does he him humble himself and submit himself? It's partly because that's the way God works. He uses the humble to, to basically make the strong seem foolish. You know, to, he uses the meek and the poor so that he can expose the arrogance and the pride of those who are strong in their own sense. But when we are strong with the, with, because of the Lord, when we are strong in blessing others because he has blessed us, that strength gives us heart and it gives us courage. It encourages us because we're acting with his strength. We're acting with his love. We're doing it out of the abundance that he has to give us. And he, has, he sustains us through that. He, he not only prepares us, but equips us at that point. There, our scriptures today go on to say, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's what it was. God came down to be with us. Not to lord it over us. Not to just sit at our feet and be humble before us. But to take that journey with us. From our creation and from our conception all the way to our death. From the cradle to the grave. God desires to know every part of that relationship with us. And he has. He's known us as a child because he was a child. He's known us as a teenager because he was a teenager. He knows us as we near our death because he willingly faced his death, that we might be spared from the final consequences of death. So God told all this to Joseph in his dream. We get it now, historically, and to encourage us as well that God was working. He had a plan. He was preparing. And here he prepared Joseph's heart. He gave Joseph the wisdom. He gave Joseph the knowledge he needed. He gave Joseph the strength he needed. And he encouraged him and gave him the hope and tied into that past promise so that Joseph then willingly was going to take Mary as his wife and Jesus accept him as his son. And so when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus, Yeshua, which is the more proper name. Same form as Joshua, which is a common name through the Bible. The Lord saves, Yahweh saves. And that was what Jesus came to do. He came to save. And there's no one that he doesn't desire and hasn't done the work for to save. But we must come to the manger. 
We can't stand off on the outside and attack it. We can't stand off on the outside and throw rocks at it. You don't get saved through that. You have to come and submit with him and embrace him, just like the babe in the manger. He, isn't, he didn't come to us in the form of a mighty warrior that we would come behind on his strength. He came to us so that we might submit as he submitted that we might submit our hearts and open them up and, and, and tear down whatever walls we built around them that are trying to protect ourselves because we've been hurt before. Whatever that might be for you or for me, he can overcome that hurt. If you let him through that barrier, he can then begin to put new life into your heart, just like the new life of a baby. And as it grows and as it matures, It'll become a stronger heart like a teenager, although it'll still make unwise decisions like a teenager too because there's still more maturity for us to grow in. And that's why we need to bring him along on that journey. And as he walks along with us and he grows as we grow, we know that he's been with us every step of the way, that there's nothing in our lives that we've faced that he hasn't already faced. And that even in in spite of what looks like a sinful situation, like Joseph and Mary's situation, where it looks like sin is abounding. And maybe in our context today, we think of divorces or, or addictions or whatever other sins break our relationships and cause harm and we see around us. That doesn't mean that God isn't working in the world. It means that he is. He came to break those addictions and he came to restore those relationships and to overcome that sinfulness. And he came to know us intimately as brother and sister, but more importantly, to connect us to our Father that we had lost relationship with. And so whatever it is that's taking the heart out of your life this holiday season, whatever it is that that maybe is, is, is causing darkness in your heart. And especially as we get past Christmas and we get into the, the long months of winter where people more often are depressed because it's dark and it's snowy and it's cold and there's no holiday to look forward to and tax season is coming and all that stuff. Remember that he is there for you, that he wants to give you a new heart, that he wants to massage and encourage and build life into your heart. Regardless of your circumstances, he never will forsake you. He will always be there at the manger, ready for you to submit to him, ready for you to bow down and embrace him so that you might be holding on to him throughout his life until he's on the cross, bearing his death instead of your death. The babe in the manger Christmas season is maybe easier for us to understand what that submission looks like, for what it means to become a Christian, that it's not just, oh yeah, I read the words and I say this and I'm a Christian, but it's the fact that we submit to that relationship, that we draw into it, and that we stop attacking him and stop belittling him and just accept him as what he is wherever he needs to meet us in our lives. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for the Christmas time of year. But as Christmas comes and goes, we pray that we remember that, babe in the manger, that you fulfilled your promises in new life and a new birth. And that that new birth might remind us of the birth that we have as Christians into a new life as Christians. And that that life needs to be nurtured and, and massaged by your word and by prayer with you, Lord. I pray that for each and every one here, and myself included, that we be equipped and matured in our faith through relationship with you. That we embrace you as the baby Jesus. That we walk arm in arm with you as an older, more mature Jesus and that we go with you to the cross taking our sins with us that we might drop them at the feet of the cross that you might take them and make them as if they never existed. 
Thank you for this great present of your grace this Christmas season, Lord. We thank you for all the gifts you give us through your word. But most especially this season, we think of your joy and your peace, your gentleness and your self-control, your knowledge, your wisdom, your power. All these things are given to us that we might give glory to you. So as we go forth today, may your glory shine through our eyes, through our mouths, and through our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We continue with our hymn, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Please rise as you are able as we close with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his almighty peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Reminder, Sunday school kids and teachers, you'll be going right to practice today. Or no, right to Sunday school and then practice. And um, for those who come back out through the door, I have Christmas cards and my wife wrote a book when she was a kindergarten teacher, so we're still giving away a lot of those. So if you would like uh, some of those, you're welcome to those as well But at the back door. Uh, with that, I ask that you spend your time this week working on your heart and thinking about that for others in your lives who you might be able to bless in their hearts with the Word of God. Amen. <laughs>